Hey guys, this is Cast Through the Tape, and today you join me for episode 9 of Kerbal Rising, and we start around our home planet of Nebos, sending another frigate out to the Julian system to link up with our expeditionary fleet, which is currently liberating all of the planets in the outer solar system. This is a Cyclops class frigate Mark II, the same kind we launched last time with its three anti ship, uh, anti uh, point defense lasers, and a railgun, and uh, two 1.25 meter torpedoes. This is the UFN Fortitude, a, uh, well, another frigate, 150 millimeters of armor, two torpedoes, and all of that good stuff. This will be supporting our fleet is, as it, uh, well, moves to engage the rather terrifying fleet around uh, Lathe, because, well, I'm starting to think that uh, that's a pretty tough fleet, and we might be lacking some, uh, lacking some ships, really. Currently, it's a destroyer, two frigates, a skiff, and a corvette, so I thought maybe another frigate would be in order, and maybe some smaller ships later, actually. But for now, I think this is a pretty formidable force. Those extra two uh, torpedoes are going to be really important, because, well... They're very, very deadly, um, so yeah, that should be good. Anyway, it arrives at Jewel, of course. You can see the, uh, I think, Lathe and Tylo hanging there in the distance, looking rather beautiful. And uh, at Tylo, before we can move down to Lathe, we need to send our carriers down to Val, because Val is before Lathe and has some forces on it, which we need to take out before we can move into the, uh, into the system. So we're sending the UFN Hercules and the UFN Titan down to Val, the little... Uh, well, I guess there's a couple of blue dots in uh, a couple of blue planets, but the the blue planet without any water, the the rocky one. Um, this has a quite a fair, well, quite a force of tanks, not as big as the one on Tylo, but uh, a force nonetheless that we'll have to vanquish if we are to carry on through this system. So we deploy our Ostrich Mark II carrier planes, and they uh, head on down to the surface. Uh, Val, luckily, is a fairly it doesn't have a particularly high gravity. Um, so it'll be much easier to land on than Tylo. We had a little bit of trouble with that last time, almost hitting the ground quite hard. But, um, but yeah, this shouldn't be too much of a problem. We should be able to just VTOL all the way down and actually come in pretty steep so we can just pick our landing site really easily. So we're just going to land sort of here. Um, this is, uh, well, yeah, here-ish. Annoyingly, this is kind of on the poles, so it's always going to be a little bit dark because there's a bunch of hills around it. So, uh, it's always going to be a bit shady. Anyway, we uh, bring down, bring ourselves down now with the with the VTOL engine, um, just really gr gracefully touching down. I quite like the Ostrich. It's a really useful and versatile vehicle, um, but there will be some different landing vehicles in the future, as you see our new fleet building up. Um, you'll see a bit of that at the end of this episode. Anyway, we touch down and do the usual thing of bouncing and then rocking and then freaking out that we're going to flip the plane. But luckily, it's a pretty tough plane, so that wing stops us from flipping over. Um, if there was slightly higher gravity, Maybe that would have been a little catastrophic, but it was okay on Val. And then, of course, we bring the tanks out after bringing down our other ostrich. We are all here now, all of our forces ready to go and destroy our enemies. These Manta Ray Mark IIs, of course, are uh, packing their usual uh, usual weaponry of the 57mm Bofors, which fires quite fast, and then the 105mm um, twin barrel thing, which is just very deadly, packs a real serious punch. Um, and yeah, here we are, a little, uh, little, a little, almost like a forward operating base made up of ostrich planes. Anyway, it's time to head on over, and it looked really flat, actually. I was kind of thinking that this would, um, just be, uh, we'd start firing really early because it's a really flat surface, but, uh, kind of a really flat land, there's not a ton of hills, but there is a ridge in front of the base, so once again, we're going to get pretty close. Um, before the fighting starts, although that doesn't stop the enemies from firing at us. Um, I thought they were just kind of firing wildly, but a lot of the shots get sort of pretty close, actually, um, which uh, probably isn't ideal and probably not great for them because they're spending a lot of ammo doing this, but they do uh, keep me on my toes a little bit with shots like that. Um, but I'm not really sure what's happening because I can't fire at them, but they're firing at me, but I think they might just be confused. Anyway, eventually we do get over to the hill and within one kilometer um, range and start opening fire with all of our guns and things start exploding. We're taking fire from some, looks like lighter guns. I'm not sure if the enemy kind of big tank guns fired. I think they may have spent all of their ammo trying to shoot us before we got there. And uh, this is just a bit of a murder, really. I mean, we just start ripping apart tanks really quickly with this, uh, the combined and sustained fire of the two types of manta rays. They just don't really stand up to us and just explode quite quickly. You can see two of them are already shattered into debris and there will soon be a third and a fourth, just piles of debris where tanks once were. Um, and yeah, this is probably the uh, easiest battle I've done yet. Um, I think I've just 
that have uh, these tanks work really well together. I think these are a really good combination. Um, I will upgrade them a little bit because I think they're a little small right now, or just could be better. But uh, for now, it's an okay combination. Um, and yeah, these uh, enemies just get just ruined. R like I didn't have to edit this at all. This is just they, they, we walked in and murdered everyone. It was really easy. <laughs> um, that's always good. But we are, you know, these are very highly trained. Um, and highly experienced uh, tank drivers now. They've had a lot of experience just eviscerating their enemies on planets. You know, they just they just do it. They just walk in, they're ready now, they just like shoot this guy, kill everything. You know, these are the like special forces at this point. It's good. But anyway, you may have noticed on our little uh, on our way in, there was a, a bit of a a bit of an interesting feature to this base. This is one of the anomalies in Kerbal Space Program, and uh, rather mysterious. It doesn't look like it was built at the same time as uh, all of these other uh, buildings. It looks rather out of place, and perhaps the Celestial League, which is the uh, the um, civilization that seems to occupy Jewel, uh, built this base around the this kind of anomalous-looking piece of henge, this odd thing that seems to point in a direction. I don't really know. But, uh, yeah, interesting. Maybe there are more secrets to Jewel than just enemy spaceships. But we'll uh, figure that out. We'll bring in some scientists and analyze it at some point. But for now, we'll just watch the rest of the tanks just sort of explode. <laughs> anyway, with Val vanquished, we can now move down to Lathe, where there is a slightly more scary force than four tanks and a strange henge that, you know, is freaking all our pilots out. They're like, what is that? Is, that a, is it a secret space laser? Um, oh my god, what if it's a secret space laser? We'll, we'll get some, we'll go check it out. Anyway, yeah, so we're moving in, uh, our fleet now for a bit of an attack. We're gonna open up, as usual, with a missile salvo, starting with four missiles, uh, four, one, four small missiles from, uh, the Beluga-class Corvette, um, which is, well, they're, they're just like the smallest, you know, least deadly missiles, but I'm gonna go for the enemy frigate, because here, there is quite the fleet. There is a frigate. There is a destroyer with twin 155mm railguns, and there is just a collection of, I think, three corvettes and two skiffs with lasers and guns, and everything has armor, so uh, this might be a little rough. So we're gonna try and get as much advantage and try and take out the capital ships as best we can with our missiles before moving in with guns. So yeah, you can see I'm just accelerating these missiles one by one, because I find that's actually just the easiest way to do it if it's like four missiles, because it's not that hard to control. Um, and yeah, once we get within 10 kilometers though, the uh, lasers do open up and do start hitting, although they're not that accurate because because our surface velocity is very high. Basically, BD Armory works best when the sur surface velocity is low, but because there's no geosynchronous, well, lathe synchronous orbit altitude, we're moving really fast relative to the surface, so they're not that accurate, but they do start hitting. Um, so, yeah, maybe the missiles are more effective than they would be because of just Lathe not having a good altitude to put ships at. Anyway, um, there are also a whole other bunch of other things firing at us. Rail guns, 30 mils, everything else. Um, although the destroyer doesn't seem to be firing that much, it seems to be rotating, and I had real trouble stopping it, as you'll see later. But anyway, our missiles do get uh, get past the laser defense. I think the lead missile just in front of us has lost a warhead, so it doesn't do much damage when it uh, is going to hit the frigate, but it looks like all the other three missiles will find their mark as well. And they do indeed, smashing through the armor, ripping off a railgun, and taking a huge chunk out of that front beam, leaving this, uh, this uh, ship pretty vulnerable. And uh, yeah, you can get a nice look at the uh, other ships there. The destroyer in particular looks beautiful. Um, but we are not done, and we don't want the destroyer looking beautiful for long. So we release our bigger missiles, our 1.25 meter missiles. These have been upgraded because it turns out when you scale up BD Armory warheads like we were doing before, it doesn't increase their damage. So these are actually going to be more powerful than you've seen before, which might make for some uh, interesting uh, shots because. They're quite powerful now. Um, <laughs> anyway, with the uh, frigate pretty damaged, we're going to go for the destroyer. I think now that there's a hole in the frigate's armor, we should be able to destroy that with guns fairly easily. The smaller ships, hard to hit with missiles and probably not really worth it. We just need to take out that destroyer. So we're going to send all four 1.25 meter torpedoes towards the destroyer. We start taking fire, especially quite early because these are quite big missiles and they seem to be shooting all of the missiles. But the accuracy isn't great as we get closer like before, so yeah. Um, they don't do a great job, and I think almost or maybe three of the missiles get through undamaged. And remember that rotating I was talking about that I couldn't stop on the destroyer? Yeah, so now we shoot it in the back with missiles, and um, 
kind of cuts itself in half. Kind of, I know I say this a lot, but it is cleaved in twain. Just ripped apart. That is beautiful. I mean, holy hell. It's not actually dead. It still has one of its rail guns on the active half of the ship. But uh, we're going to try and deal with that. But it's a rotating reference frame and it's moving. So it's really hard to hit with a missile. So we don't actually manage to do that. But holy shit, I was not expecting that. It just rips it apart. Anyway, one of the missiles goes through and I decide I'm going to use this to knock out the frigate. So uh, we line ourselves up with the frigate um, so that we can deal with all of these capital ships. Well, I guess a frigate isn't really a capital ship, but it's a big ship. We can deal with all the big ships. And we hit this in the back, of course, because we're coming from behind. And um, yeah, it, it sort of just throws it forward and rips off everything. And it isn't dead, but it's not in good shape. And uh, yeah, that was pretty awesome to see it just thrown forward by the explosion. That's amazing. And, happily, we haven't really destroyed any of the ships, but we have split the fleet apart. So I decide, right now I'm going to race for that frigate. It's really damaged. I think we can take it out pretty easily. We're going to go down there and we're going to try and take it out right now. I think it'll be the easiest target and it would just be good to get something killed. And then afterwards we'll go and find the smaller ships and hope they haven't regrouped with um, the destroyer because then they're like in an actual group and it might be quite difficult. But I just think the, the frigate might be the priority right now. I think we can take it out pretty easily if we went for the destroyer which has been moved away from the fleet of uh, smaller ships. We'd have to go through the smaller ships. So I think this is just the easiest way to do it. And we do get ourselves a nice shot which will probably be the thumbnail on the way there. So uh, yeah. <laughs> so we're just heading south a bit to catch up with this frigate and avoid the rest of the ships. I think we're going to take a advantage of the fact that we managed to split apart the fleet. Didn't really think that would happen, but uh, I'm quite happy that it did. And we start getting into range, and uh, the destroyer opens up with its 155mm railgun, which is rather deadly, and uh, and it comes in and hits, and just, I, I know I say this a lot, but cleaves it in twain. <laughs> it, it, cuts, uh, it cuts right through one of the, uh, the pieces of uh, ship and rips off the boom taking off the railgun from the ship. Now it, uh, the frigate just has anti-ship lasers left. So we're pretty much just free to just shoot the shit out of it. Like, we get into range and the uh, our frigates start opening up and the enemy frigate starts taking insane amounts of fire from both the 155 and the 55mm railguns. The 55s are the one, by the way, that look kind of orangey. The smaller looking yellow ones are the 55mm railguns. I don't know why they look smaller, but... Uh, yeah, anyway, eventually, uh, well, quite quickly, we rip off another piece of armor, exposing the cockpit entirely, and uh, just fire keeps coming in from three frigates with four railguns and one destroyer with a railgun. Um, and yeah, it gets shot a lot. Like, a lot, a lot. Like, holy shit. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm really liking this just large amount of ships with railguns. It does a lot of damage from range, and it's great for taking out bigger ships. Not great on smaller ships, as we'll talk about later, but, uh, this frigate, well, it just won't stand up long. It does take a lot of fire, actually. I'm impressed. Look at all these shots coming in. It's just, yeah, it... it <laughs> It's a pretty hardy ship. These Celestial League ships are pretty brutal, especially with the ringed armor. It makes it really hard to get shots in, which is really annoying. I might steal that design. Um, <laughs> but eventually, a railgun round finds its mark and just destroys the frigate. Just cuts it into tiny pieces. So yeah, anyway, now you would think that I would go and find the smaller ships and take them out. But I'm not going to do that, because... I don't actually think, like, I think the fleet's pretty good at p taking out bigger ships, but it doesn't really have enough smaller ships to fight with smaller ships. Like, it can shoot them from range and things, but eventually we are going to get into range of each other, and I think the enemy's, like, mass amount of lasers is going to be a real big problem for bigger ships. So I'm going to, next turn, launch some more smaller ships for this fleet and, uh, and try and win the battle that way, and then probably go after the destroyer if it hasn't regrouped. I think its engines are destroyed, so it might not be able to. Anyway, yeah, so that's the plan. I'm going to leave that battle there for now. We're going to pull out and uh, wait. This won't slow us down at all because we couldn't take over Lathe anyway uh, because we've spent our ground forces this time on Val. Um, so yeah, that's the plan. Uh, so we'll have even more battle next time, but I think this turn it went pretty well, but it is time to pull out for now. So with that done, we're moving back over to Nebos where we're preparing our home fleet as we were last turn where we deployed two frigates, the UFN Claudius and the UFN I've Forgotten. Um, <laughs> and today we're deploying a new carrier, a much smaller carrier, a light carrier actually. Um, it doesn't really have any difference, but that's just what I call it because it's smaller. And a skiff. This is the Dart class skiff, a part of a new kind of 
sort of class of ships we'll be deploying of all classes, really. Um, but this is taking what we've learned from uh, the Trident class skiff, that these are really good, fast, close attack ships. And, uh, well, just kind of buffed it up a bit, made it smaller, sleeker, um, given it an anti-ship laser and quite a lot of armor, 300 millimeters of armor. We'll be deploying another one of these to complete the home fleet for now next turn. And uh, these are going inside the UFN Griffin, which is a, a Griffin class uh, carrier. A much smaller carrier capable of carrying, um, I think, uh, basically up to six skiffs or... Uh, or six skiffs or four skiffs and two corvettes it probably will never carry that much in fact i think that's outside of the rules but um still yeah it, it's capable of carrying quite a lot but it's much more compact than the gigantic uh titan class carriers uh no yeah titan class carriers because those were just big and unwieldy and not that useful because the door was on the side so a front door makes it able for these to just move out quickly and do some damage. And I like how these ships look. These are skiffs, they're, they, the, the wings, which aren't wings by the way, they're booms for holding radiators. <laughs> totally not entirely aesthetic, they're really useful. <laughs> but I just quite like how they look. They're sleeker, they're actually smaller than the Trident class skiffs, and um, I think they're gonna do a really good job. And uh, this is of course our light carrier, the UFN Griffin, and you can see it has landing pods on the bottom, drop pods, because this can't fit a ostrich Mark II, so it's now just got a couple of drop pods um, in amongst this kind of cowling around it. Um, so yeah, this is the start of our home fleet. A slightly different set of tactics, not gigantic ships so much, something more fast attack and reactive is what I'm going for here. Um, so this is heading down to Moho because there's been... As you may know, we've lost some ships around Moho to a mysterious, invisible ship has been firing torpedoes at frigates and corvettes down there. So we're sending a proper fleet to go and defend it. We've got uh, two uh, general purpose uh, frigates and a, a skiff, a skiff and a carrier. The carrier itself does have an anti-point uh, uh, defense laser for just defending itself should it need to. And uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the, the skiff has an anti-ship laser, as I said, for fast attack. And I think these should be able to defend Moho quite well, and eventually go and root out our enemies at Scorch. I would have done that this turn, actually. I would have gone over there, but I needed to deploy that frigate first. So this is the end of the turn, so I can move these into my own territory, but I can't, like, attack with these ships. So we're delaying our advances into uh, into Scorch to find out our uh, to find our new enemies. Um, but it had to be done, because we had a lot to do around Lathe. But anyway, for now, that is the end of the episode. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you're looking forward to, well, part two of the battle around Lathe. Holy shit, that's going to be a big, uh, a big thing. It was just a big battle. That took ages to record anyway. Um, but I do think I need more smaller ships for that. I don't want to risk too much damage for just not much game. So yeah, <clears throat> anyway, uh, I'm, I'm sorry this has been a bit late. I mean, it's been, I meant to get this up last weekend, but... I had some trouble recording it, and I've also been really busy. The thing I'm working on at work is going into private beta in like a week, so uh, that's uh, taking up a lot of my mental power, so <laughs> yeah. Anyway, but uh, yeah, we're, uh, hopefully the next one will be up quicker. I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, this has been episode 9 of Kerbal Rising. I will see you next time.